Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. Niall Mackey, the commercial director at TopSec Cloud Solutions here in Ireland, joins the show this week as we take an inside look at how businesses cope in the aftermath of a hack. Niall Mackey is a tech industry veteran with over 35 years experience with TopSec, Nokia, Interroot, now GTT, Bank of America, and more. With TopSec, Niall looks at the commercial opportunities and influences the direction of service development to make sure they continue to bring value to their customers. TopSec have been pioneering cloud-based email and web security for more than two decades, servicing the government, healthcare, engineering, and IT sectors to name a few. In this episode, Niall sheds some light on the gradually, then all at once impact felt by a business undergoing a cyber attack, from social engineering and phishing to ransomware attacks. We talk through the psychological impact on those who are keeping watch, how those teams pick up the pieces, and the impact on customer trust. All right here on Money Never Sleeps. How's the weather in your neck of the woods today? It's actually lovely, bizarrely. It's actually sunny outside, so that's that's unusual. <laughs> yeah, no, we got a bit of sun over here. I woke up with a pitter-patter of rain on the roof up in the, uh, up yeah. in the attic where the, where the master bedroom is. I was thinking, oh man, I got to get up. I'm not going to be able to get out from my walk in the rain. By the time I got up a half hour later, because I was looking at my phone for a half hour to start the day, boom, the rain's gone. That's yeah. Ireland for you, right? You don't like the weather? Just it wait is, five minutes. Yeah. And I take it you you came here because you married someone. That's often the way how people get to these places and uh, at, came to Ireland. Is that correct? I did. I did. But in <laughs> 1842, the family <laughs> Harrington left Allahees in West Cork, actually Bally Donegan in Allahees in West Cork, and went to Newport, Rhode Island to go help oh, wow. build Fort Adams. And my great 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 grandfather, wow. Daniel Harrington, That's a cool story. was a bricky, and he helped yeah. build the smelt building in Allahees and the, for the copper mines there. And uh, there was a general in the US that came over and recruited in the west of Ireland and ended up in West Cork. and. Daniel Harrington agreed to go, and that was 1842. If he hadn't right. left there when he was 14 and then arrived on his 15th birthday, I wouldn't be here right now. So I thought <laughs> as a service to him and the journey that he took to travel across the Atlantic and arrived in Newport, Rhode Island, back in 1842, that I'd just come back here and reclaim the bloodline. But I also did, yes, meet an Irish woman <laughs> along the way in my Off travels and stopover in Bermuda from 2000 to 2005, so... Bermuda. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Because I have my part of my family actually lived in Bermuda. My my mom's side of the family, her brother, my uncle actually lived, was in Bermuda. Uh, he was working in the police, and he married a local Bermudan, and so he, she, he he they came back to Ireland. Actually, yeah. So I've got a Bermuda wing. Still, people in Bermuda I'm related to. Very cool. So. Very cool. There's a bit. There's a, a very strange similarity between the Bermudian accent and the Cork accent. So really, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to do it because I will embarrass myself, <laughs> okay, as all my friends tell me to do. They're like, Pete, stick with your accent. After a few points, yeah. yeah you know, so, but it's, yeah, that, w- that was 18 years ago when I got here. So I've uh, been back to Bermuda once. We'd love to get back there because we got to show the kids the place where we met, right? We've shown them plenty yeah, of pictures and Google Maps spot. and all those other things yeah. where they can see where we were. But, yeah. but listen, what you and I chatted probably about a month ago at this point, mm-hmm. and with an introduction from Claire Mason. So thank you, Claire, and shout out to Claire. She's wonderful. She always does good introductions. Yeah, she's great, yeah. Very thoughtful conversations that I seek to have with people and that go off the track a bit from where we usually go on this podcast and that with your history in the space of security and cybersecurity, and there's been quite a number of sensitivities around security lately in my field, obviously in crypto, Mm. where there's no such thing as cybersecurity. It's just all security, right? Because there's nothing that's not cyber. So it's all just security that we've seen tons of things that have happened over the last five to six years. And, Mm. you know, people don't think too much about the psychology of this and how it gets in, how it can get inside people's head. Okay. So I wanted to look at this with you and to kind of set mm-hmm. the stage a bit, Niall, maybe just share with us your backstory and how you got to this point and your sure. journey into TopSec 
cloud solutions, yeah. which is kind of <laughs> the palette really for this discussion, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it was a bit of a convoluted. It certainly wasn't a planned life, you know. So oh, I'm always amazed there's people who have these plans for their lives and they just do all these things like exactly how they're supposed to they go to college, they get the degree they wanted, they go and start and they get the right internship and the right big big five or big four company and it all seems to just like tick boxes and they go on this wonderful path but mine certainly wasn't that but anyway so i mean i was on course to be another irish accountant back in the 80s when you know the when your parents encouraged you to have a nice safe job and i loved economics but i was kind of meh about kind of uh, accountancy itself and then in my final year sixth year in ireland as we call it i i was always a bit confrontational in regards to religion and I would ask too many questions and and I worked to, I went to a, a Christian brother well a Christian brother a De La Salle brother's school so we still had brothers there teaching and especially religion so they got fed up of me and they kicked me out basically of the uh, not not of the school but of the, the class and so I was given a choice to either go to the study hall and just study or they had the computer room now when I say a computer room it was it was very much pushing it it, it was the most basic you know one, one PC one print and three nerds sitting there but I suddenly discovered like you could actually input stuff and stuff would come out and you could you know with basic as it was then and I loved it immediately so I just that, that's what I decided I was going to go to as it was called then the RTC and now Southeast I think Technology University Technological University or something and learn how to be a computer programmer basically so RPG, COBOL, Clipper, DBase, 3 plus all these cutting edge things back then and uh, although some of them are still in existence now COBOL I've got a mate who's still making a living out of out of going around the world as a contractor with all the big ba- all the banks and health oh, yeah. health authorities and stuff and he's making bank still I, I <laughs> and he reckons being, he'll get to retirement yeah I, people are being called out of <laughs> retirement for this right and it, <laughs> that's it, right know, in, interesting crossover point I was kicked out of my what was called CCD class back when I was probably 14 <laughs> which was religion because I went to a, a school that, that was not, a, I didn't go to a Catholic school. They were called public schools. Yeah. And that I was asking too many questions. And so <laughs> the, the CCD teacher, this very nice lady, probably in her 70s, called my mom and said, listen, you know, Pete's probably asking a, lo- a lot of questions that <laughs> I'm not sure the other people want, the other kids in the class are, are, are asking. And my mom said to the teacher, well, isn't it that your job to answer them? You know, yeah. So <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I I was booted, but somehow I got back <laughs> in and did my did my confirmation, whatever. But also then, yes, yeah. the COBOL thing, quite interesting. I almost ended yeah. up as a COBOL programmer. I was offered a job to to become one, and I said no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. how how did you transition from more of the hardcore technical into the the more commercial side? So I ended up going to the UK because if people who, who are my age and, you know, will know that Ireland in the 80s was very different to Ireland now. People give out about Ireland now, but like, Jesus, it's, it's a, it, it was a different place back then. So an example in my class in, in Waterford, only four of the 50 people that graduated actually stayed in Ireland. Wow. So every, everyone just went. So we had, a, we have, I had some over a pint sometime I'll tell you the mad stories we had in London of people sharing houses we had two student basically houses that continued off in 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 the less salubrious parts of London and uh, I, I actually ended up in the working for the Masons would you believe it in Stamford Brook near Hammersmith the Masons like the actual uh, Masons the, at the actual Masons in the Royal Masonic Hospital, and it was so that that that, that was an interesting place to work. And so I, but they were actually also quite smart. They had the, the in the hospital they had they were they were actually plugged into clinical trials and stuff like for seasickness and all these kind of things. It was a it was a fun place to work. But getting back to your question, I discovered there that I was one of the few IT people that actually could talk to normal mm. people. You know, so so I I kind of naturally started even then as quite young, drifting into kind of management and like helping with organizational requirements and translating them to the guys of the team as to what they actually want. And you know, because there's often a disconnect between IT and and the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you need those translators, <laughs> those bridges. Yeah, so so that's, so that's that's where I ended up, and then actually, funny enough, I ended up working for Bank of America in in, in Richmond, which was really cool actually, and because they were quite innovative at the time, and we did the first paperless office stuff, and and, and I had this mad Cuban boss who literally used to smoke big cigars, and he he's uh, he's one of, the, one of the funniest guys, like but in he, the office, he, but he invested in us in the office. He was an incredible guy. He was a big, he was a stereotypical 
big Cuban guy with a cigar and he would take us all to lunch, pay for everything all the time. And he, his idea of a holiday was sending his wife and his children and his dogs away on holiday for two weeks. And he would sit there reading the Financial Times, eating pizza and drinking beer <laughs> you know, and smoking cigars by the pool. That was his holiday. Fantastic. <laughs> he was just one. Of, he was a, he was a character. <laughs> Fantastic. Really smart guy. Really smart guy. Then I moved on to kind of got into more into the kind of te- the, the kind of networking side of things. So I ended up working for a company called Interroot, which Mentos. This, that was actually really cool too because I got to basically travel around Europe. They, they were they were putting fiber, dark fiber, into the ground all around all around Europe, uh, undersea loops around you know, Central Europe, Germany, France, into Italy, and they were also buying up loads of. Really regional kind of telcos and stuff. And my job was to integrate all those disparate systems and, and companies into one integrated solution, which was kind of fun. I was fascinated by mobile at the time. And I don't remember the the first the kind of Nokia WAP phones, yeah. the 7110. So I actually got one of those, kind of the old, not quite the Matrix, but nearly the Matrix phone, and wrote an actual WAP gateway, messing with it. And then bizarrely, a kind of a headhunter came along and said, said well, I'd be interested in actually moving to Nokia because Nokia were getting into the whole services side of things, so not just the networks. Like, so I, I got involved in that and was involved in locate and developing their location-based services offering. There, they had this really cool thing called M Platform as well, which was hasn't even been realised today. And it's kind of they had this thing of the arc of the day where your mobile device actually pushed you information relevant to your what you were doing, like you mentioned this morning that you were, it was raining to get for your walk. It would, it would actually tell you, like you went, wake up and say, look, it's actually raining today. So you might want to take the, take the bus or, or use the car rather than actually walk to the train or it's your wife's birthday. So I've ordered your flowers and okay. these, all that kind of integrated stuff. We were actually doing that like back in the, back in the early 2000s, you know, so it was, but it, the, the, the systems weren't there to actually deliver the idea which is a shame, but, but, it, but it was fun. And I suppose it was the kind of a whole AI machine learning before we, before kind of, a, it was, it was cool to talk about like it is now and, and everything else. So those were early days. And then I came and, back. And I, you know, hear stories like this all days. the time that, you know, it was yeah. Mark Cuban, speaking of Cubans, right. That back in <laughs> the late nineties that he had done the deal to, what was it? Broadcast.com or he was actually the founder of broadcast.com, I think. And that it was, Netflix in the nineties, but oh, he wow. was too early because the bandwidth just wasn't yes. there. Right. That's correct. Like I, yeah. I remember in, in even in Bermuda in the early two thousands on Napster and being able to download one song <laughs> would take 20 minutes. Right. Yes. And, and, and it's just all these fantastic ideas have been there. It's just that timing, exactly. And timing and with not being able to do it. Yeah. And then where did you, t- yeah, where, did, yeah. where did you take things from there from the, those kind of experiences so, with Nokia? So, then I, I I I got married and I was actually working in 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 Paris at the time, actually doing that in platform stuff with with France Telecom. My wife's Irish, actually. I, uh, I met, met her over in London, and so we decided while we loved London, we loved Paris, we loved the spaces. They weren't ideal to bring up kids, and so we decided, like you know, I, I'd come back to to Ireland, and and I, I Nokia really didn't have anything in Ireland, but like I, I said, look, I'm going. So I I actually resigned and I said, look, I'll pick something up. So so they created an opportunity for me. So I arrived in Ireland and Nokia had no business at all. So literally I was in an office in Harcourt Street. But then there was a lot of traveling. And I love traveling, but like I had young kids and they were very sick. And I was traveling three weeks out of four. And I'd seen so many families, like literally everyone I know in Nokia is divorced. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And and they don't know their kids and they don't get on with their kids and I didn't I didn't want that you know and then kind of long way to, to, to where you were I, I ended up at Topsec because I had been exposed to security at Nokia when we were doing a lot of the deals and stuff because we used to use obviously we, we we would give the whole packet core things as well so we had firewalls and and security on those and we had the, the like the WAF gateways and the multimedia messaging <laughs> the, the guy kind of goes aging myself now the, all those kind of things and so there was obviously security had to be part of that so I. I, I was always kind of interested in that, and then and that's how I, I got into Topsec because they were a specialist kind of email security provider. Okay, and that you know that that specialty is what jumped right out at me is that all right, let's just focus on the fundamentals here, and that one of the most fundamental gateways into your business is your email, and that can yeah. just be just fraught with risk. And tell tell me a bit about Topsec, and what that business looks like today. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, just 
the whole email security thing is fascinating because I think it's been around for so long that people have almost take it for granted that it's there. But as you said, it's the front door for like 90% of exploits that actually happen, happen via email. Now, other things happen, like they, they get onto your endpoints and all that kind of stuff. And But actually... They come in through the front door, but yeah, everyone has all these systems. Like they like the way it's visualized. They've SWAT teams at the back door. They've SWAT teams by the windows, but they have an old man in a Zimmer frame at the front door. Mm. You know, and 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 they, they they're not protecting the main the main the main attack vector into their organization. So anyway, what Topsec do? It's we do we don't just provide a server. Uh, sorry, an actual piece of software. It's a service. So we 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 do gateway email security. We do plugins to three six five. You can have both together because because they work well together do all the zero day stuff but it's also a managed service so we're actually monitoring 24 7 what's happening on your network so if we see anomalous behavior we have a machine learning ai type stuff as well but we also have human beings which is also important to actually looking at this and if we see strange behavior we'll automatically quarantine stop that traffic contact the organization and you know and we and we tend to work with larger kind of organizations who value that level of service or maybe who don't have a dedicated sock themselves you know like a lot of organizations now have put this in place, whether they they have their own SOC, a security operations center, actually monitoring this stuff. But even still, some of them will use us because we know more about email security th- th- than they will, because this is all we do. It's our niche. You, you, know, you can't have your dead domain being able to easily be spoofed, which, which to be honest... 80% of organizations out there now, I could go on and I could pretend to be them easily. And I could, I could spend an email on their behalf to somebody else, or I could do a spear phishing attack into them that would look exactly like it was coming from, because it is, it's coming from their domain. We make it easy for organizations. We give them advice. We, our, own, our own tiny little niche, email security, but we, we're kind of experts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I was listening to a podcast the other morning. It was On the Brink, which is Castle Island Ventures in Boston. And one, one of the ones I listen to, you know, pretty much yeah. every week. And they had Jeff Lungelhofer on, who's the chief information security officer at Coinbase. And he's talking about, listen, yes, Coinbase have fantastic security all around their entire ecosystem. The one thing that you need to ask customers to do is to say, please just control your entry point, which is generally going to be someone's Gmail account. And that turn on two-factor authentication. Use that Google Authenticator. Every time you sign into Gmail, that brings you up to kind of like the 99% secure element of all of this. And that it's just that one simple point is that email yeah. in. Yeah. And it's not that people are stupid. It's it's that these, they're so busy. I mean, I don't know about your inbox, but like I'll get like a few hundred emails mm-hmm. a day, you know, and and you're looking them on your phone. And especially the danger, the really dangerous thing is, is this device actually, yeah. <laughs> is your phone. Because... You're looking at it, and if you've, if it's on your if you're on your laptop, or you will actually you you know maybe people don't, but a lot of people will actually hover over a link and and, and check it and and see if it, see if it's re, if it's actually what it says it is and stuff like that. But on a phone, you just can't do that or won't do that. You're just looking at an email. You see, oh, it's from someone you know. Oh, Grant, there's an attachment. What's what did he send me? What's the invoice for? He's changed it, and bang, and suddenly they're in. You know, and it's it's it, 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 and people are busy. You know, so like this, the the emails are coming through constantly. So it's it's making them more aware in the moment. I mean, that's the issue. I mean, people do cyber awareness training all the time, and and it has an effect, but it doesn't really change behavior. We're seeing the same things happening every day. You know, the, the same compromises happening, the same mistakes being made, even though people maybe have security awareness campaigns. And we do this ourselves. We actually have phishing awareness training. We do as a service as well. And we and we actually try to make ours behavior. And we have another iteration. It's not really ours, but it's it's something we sell that we think I think it's all about changing behavior at the time of compromise, which I think is probably the way to go. Like, you know, rather than trying to pre- preach to people, you actually, as they're doing something silly, it actually pops up and says, are you really sure you want to do this? because of those reasons yeah. and, and it's, it'll break these different policies that the company has and, and and it won't actually stop them doing it but it will actually first of all they know that you know that it's happening because it'll be in the logs and stuff but also it, it does trigger something with them to say should i actually keep going with this you know and, and go down this rabbit hole oh yeah you know? i mean i'm i you know i've become extremely careful i mean i still even through text right and just the old school text app you get I don't know, at least two or three messages a week saying that you've got a 
parcel waiting to be paid for DHL customers, or whatever, DHL all those ones, yeah, 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 and it's just like, yeah, just yeah. don't click. Just always Google what you know is the actual business and not the link that's yeah. been provided to you. And I, so yeah. I, I've become extremely careful, but there's still hundreds of different ways in out there. And let's just take one of them, the ransomware attack, sure. right? And that yep. w- in thinking about that word ransomware being a piece of software that then holds your system at ransom, can you paint the picture of kind of a typical attack with what you've seen and what the vulnerabilities are that are generally at the core yeah. of the attack? Yeah, no, people get kind of fixated. I will, I obviously. People get fixated on ransomware, but the phishing side of things that actually getting money and getting into links and getting it to do transfer funds is way more mm. common. But but to give an example, I mean, the, 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 there's two general ways of, of them getting in. And, and one is the, the drive-by stuff, you know, so it's not really a targeted attack. It's like, like we, you mentioned the DHL delivery notice. It's a Microsoft login update. It's a mobile account suspension. It, it's a payment confirmation with an attachment or something like that. A Christmas party is a really good one because uh, people just go blind and see Christmas party or bonus or redundancy in, in an email. They don't look at anything they just go blind and they click you know which is actually an interesting uh, social engineering construct like to actually deal with to stop people actually reacting like that because their heart rate goes up and, and they, they they react to those kind of things quite quite quickly so there's usually a, an urgent call to action uh, whether they like and whether it's to open an attachment to verify something or an actual kind of a link in there to to, to do something Whilst there are systems out there that will check those, like most people have some element of URL protection, but they're often able to hide it in layers, but those redirects and all that kind of stuff. And then you're taken to a site that looks exactly like, you know, the site you're supposed to be going to, like a Microsoft site or a DHL site. And and like the, the guys are very good at this now. It's it's actually quite hard to spot. You'd have to be able to look at like the URL exactly and things like that and other things. That, for most people who are just really reacting to it, they'll enter their details, whatever, and they'll click this. And suddenly there's a download has happened that they don't know about. And suddenly the, the guys are in and they're, they're, they're on your endpoint points they were going away encrypting data and they probably aren't going to activate anything on that day but because because a lot of the cleverer ones now what they'll do is they'll encrypt data and as you want that file they'll actually decrypt it and serve it to you and 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 then re-encrypt it again and then maybe in a, in a month's time they'll actually initiate the 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 ransom as, as, as you said and actually say right you know you pay us x and we will release your data and you'll say oh, well i've got backups i'm fine you go to your backups and suddenly you realize they're actually encrypted too. So because they've actually been encrypting and de-encrypting them over the last the last month or so. So the day the, the backups are no good. So suddenly you're in a catch twenty two situation. Like do you do you do you stick or twist? Do you actually pay or do you actually say, screw it, I'm gonna suck it up, I'm gonna wipe everything and and start again and hopefully the business can survive. Because it, it's a it's an ex, it can be an extinction event. You know, I've I've actually seen I've had people come to us and I've seen it in the last year as well. Organizations go out of business because of this. Oh yeah. Because they just didn't have the data. Like there's a, a, a really sad one in the UK, actually, because we would do a lot in the UK now. And there were a traditional logistics company like Haulier going, and they've been going like a hundred, hundred odd years, like transporting goods. And they had employed seven or eight hundred people. They weren't a big high profile company, but they were going a long time and everything. And they're gone now because they got hit by a ransomware attack. They didn't pay the ransom, and they couldn't reconstruct the organization, the data, or the, they're gone. Just yeah, gone out, out, out of business. Just and, gone. I mean, for the yeah. for the ones that you see that have survived, and just looking at the people side of this, there must be some huge weight to oh. carry on their shoulders that they've let the customers down. I've seen some horrible things. So I was actually personally involved with the two organizations, and these were these were you know high profile organizations that had. One, one was a ransomware, one, but one was actually a, a phishing attack. And the organization was actually like down for about two million. And it, the guy involved, the, the guy I know, he was the IT uh, director in the place, had been looking for extra budget. He knew where their vulnerabilities were. We had told them where their vulnerabilities were. And it, the, the organization wouldn't give him the budget to, to actually wow. remediate and to put the protections in place. And of course, a couple of months later, it happened and someone clicked on a link someone like you know changed bank details they they like you know it was a, it was a it was a spear phishing attack it was very targeted i mean i could actually give an example of one that, that, that happens but and basically money was transferred to the wrong account 
everyone jumped on IT that is, oh, IT is not protecting us. He he had been trying to protect them and their organization, like his department and everything. But the stress, obviously, of that, like, you know, of actually of actually dealing with that actually killed him. He actually died of a heart attack in his in his bed, Jesus. you know. Yeah, and that's happened twice. I've I've, I've no I know of two, at another organization, and that was an actual ransomware attack where the, they actually had the data and and um, they went through this whole process of, of of getting it back and everything. But again, the stress and and then of course when you have a ransomware attack, it's not you have to remediate it, but then you can't just leave it as it is because your systems, like 70% of companies that have been hit by a ransomware attack get hit again within three or four months because they usually leave a back door. They usually, you know, have some way of, so you basically have to purge your whole environment and start again, you know? So it's not just the work of actually remediating the actual, like, you know, ransomware incident that happened, the data that was compromised. You really have to, not trust anything anymore like zero trust and and actually you mean you mean uh, like wipe everything set up your entire system from scratch all over again with oh yeah chances. yeah you can't trust your servers you can't trust, you, like, you, you can't be 100 percent sure where they've been like you know you, you have a fair idea but like they, they probably and, and and the thing is they usually go back like it's like they usually like 70 percent like will actually try and and attack that company again wow and then you know for you know obviously maybe, maybe rest in peace for this, this acquaintance of yours that did unfortunately pass away from a heart attack from the stress of this. I mean, had, yeah. had you been had you been talking to him about his feelings about all this? Oh yeah, I mean, you could see, but you could see it on their face. I mean, like you know, all the all his team and then the two teams that involved in these two different things, like. You're working twenty four seven. You're working weekends. You, you have no family life. You, like literally, everyone's giving you. You're getting grief from everybody because everyone's shouting at them. You know, the, the business is shouting because they can't operate. The, the, even the media were involved in some of these. One of them, one, one not, one yes. So there was that. There, there, there was there was obviously the organization that, like you know, that they couldn't operate. Like they, could, they couldn't actually like you know function. And yeah, it's almost like like PTSD. I, yeah. think, I think it actually. And, and I think there's actually a study that was done by in the UK by a security think tank called I think the Royal United Services Institute and they actually did some research on this and the amount of people that they've said like it's not just with the loss of data and reputation of the organization it gets a trauma you know it is actually a trauma you know and so some people never recover from it some people do actually need and, and organizations are really poor at this actually giving them support and and, 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 and therapy to, to deal with this kind of stuff and a lot of them are terrified of losing their jobs even terrified for their reputation going for their mm-hmm. next job or, oh why didn't you work for that company that had that big thing and you go yeah yeah yeah, 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 that yeah. was me. There's, and even then, there's the the, the second order harms, like the the supply chain side of things, like their customers, the implications for those. Well, you know, are they able to deliver to them? Are they able to supply them? Are they able to look after them? Also. It, the supply chain attacks is a big thing now, actually, which we haven't actually talked about yet. But like, our, 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 like as a customer of this company, am I now vulnerable because you are compromised? Can they attack me? Yeah, you know. And the same with their suppliers. You're you're now actually a kind of a risk to my organization because you've been compromised. So you know, anything coming out of your organization could potentially compromise me, and it and it does happen. I mean, like, I was talking to companies a couple of years ago about, and someone just asked me to come speak about cybersecurity in financial services. And I said, all right, well, listen, I'll do a bit of digging and, and see if I can come up with some stories. And it was just trying to paint this picture of, like I talked about the gateway, and that you mm. just don't know how many entry points there are to your organization. Supply chain's an excellent point. And that yeah. for your own suppliers, how immersive is your platform's entry points into theirs? Yep. And yep. That, you know, you just take for granted the things such as, all right, we're going to connect via API to this platform, to this provider, yep. to this supplier, and that you don't even think about it. And there's tons of things and tons of security audits that folks do every year. What is it like ISO twenty seven thousand mm. and one? Yeah, yeah, and and there's cyber essentials and all these all things. That, yeah, yeah. That, that you know, the bigger your organization, the more resources you're going to have to be able to look at your suppliers, look at your business partners, and see how they're doing things, but if you're a small yeah. business, you're a small to medium sized enterprise. Yeah. You aren't going to have the resource to, to do that, right? Yeah. And, and also, it's going to get harder. And this is a thing people haven't seen. As larger organizations get better at this, because they are, like, one of the positive things are the, the cybersecurity is being taken more and more seriously by organizations. So that, that's a really good thing. However, they're now putting more and more constraints and demands on if you want to do business with them, 
you have to comply with all these different things. You're like, you know, you might be ISO compliant, you're cyber essentials compliant, you, where's your data residing? Is your data residing in, you know, all this kind of thing? What's, do you have MFA in place for mm-hmm. people accessing the systems that are going to access our systems? Because suddenly, like, it's putting a huge cost and onus, security onus on organizations that never had to do this before. Like, like not quite mom and pop, but like organizations like sub-20 people like who, who have a nice little business. But can they afford to have this level of sophistication in their IT security um, set up? Probably, probably going to be challenging. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and it's, you know, because it generally seems like it's such a low probability of occurrence, uh, you know, we're all set. We're not going to get hacked. That is generally the most vulnerable mindset to have. And, in and it's and it's so not the case. I just did a review there with a reason, like a, this was a 500 user organization there this uh, last week, and we we looked at their stats, and we were stopping an extinction level event virus hitting their network every day. Wow. So if we, yeah, every day, and another one that's a bit bigger, it was seven a every day. day. That would have actually Jesus. every day. Wow. Yeah, and people just take this for granted, like because. Things like email security—they work in the background. It's the only you only hear about it when it goes wrong. It's we're like a utility. It's like the the, the you only get, you only worry about like electricity and think about electricity or water when they're not there and when they don't work, you know. And an email security is kind of treated like that, you know. That oh, it's just there. It works. It'll stop all the crack. Yeah. No. I'm and I'm just thinking of like my experience with with Gmail because I use that uh, to a large extent. Most startups do, and I know you and I talked about this offline before, mm. Niall is that generally there's this expectation there that if you set up your business account on Gmail, that there'll be a certain level of security. But when and there we, is. when you guys come along, you kind of do that times 10, don't yeah. you? Yes, we do. And we will definitely, so if we start like filtering for, say, someone like yourself, we will, we typically we'll pick up between 5 and 15% of the emails that are getting through that will have either some kind of malicious content or be spam or uh, be potentially social engineering or have a like there'll be like, like to be for ransom are small you're probably talking 0.5 percent of those but like you know but social engineering probably one or two percent and the rest probably just emails you didn't really want to get they're spam basically you know but like there, there there's always a like at least one around one percent of those which is one percent is a lot if you think about all the emails you're getting that actually could use some damage could be key loggers and and the amount of people who don't know they've actually got this already in their organization i mean that, that's that's phenomenal like that, that's actually just because most of these are in stealth mode they're not actually trying to take you down they're actually trying to rob your data looking for opportunities like to get like you know access to bank accounts access to data access to you know depending on the organization the value proposition that it offers you know it's terrifying for someone when you actually explain some of this stuff to them oh yeah well i mean like even on this podcast right like i get and i may go back and edit some of these things out but when i mention who i bank with the different crypto apps i use the the fact that I have family history in Newport, Rhode Island. All of that can be used for engineering mm. and attack. And it's yeah. there is a record of me, of you, of everybody, of probably my 13-year-old daughter who's eating cereal in the background here, of <laughs> that your individual digital entity as a person online somewhere in the dark web where people are keeping track of that and saying, how many data points can we collect on yeah. Pete? How many data points can we collect on Nile? And exactly. so we, just so filling we, in the gaps so we, by talking about this yeah. stuff in public sometimes is what kind of gets yeah. me a little bit worried. So we actually started during COVID because COVID was nuts. Like we saw a 600% increase in attacks like during COVID. People just went on a feeding frenzy to because people worked from home and insecure networks. It's like, you know, they weren't using VPNs. There was It was using like devices that weren't work devices, all this kind of stuff. So it was, a, it was an absolute, you know, f- feeding frenzy. So Lots of data got compromised and work credentials. So people were started using their work credentials, like, you know, in non-work related sites, you know, because uh, they were at home and stuff. And so what we do now is we actually monitor the dark web for our customers and uh, and especially their key key staff, like the, the, the exec team, people in procurement, finance, people that can, like, you know, authorize things, change things, bank, like bank details or authorized, you know, uh, transfers, et cetera. And we actually look for their data on the dark web to see if they have, say, their Facebook account, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever it is, all, all that kind of stuff. 
where they've been compromised, say they might have been compromised on a booking.com or a LinkedIn attack or so, and that data is now on the dark web. As you mentioned, those people do some research and say, right, Pete's information, I, I've got his, I, here, here's his Facebook login, here's his, you know, LinkedIn login, here's his Twitter X account, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then they can actually build up a profile of, of you and how you phrase things, how you, how you send emails, how you communicate your style. Also, you're probably a good guy, but most people use the same password in a lot of their accounts, even though they're not supposed to. And like, they, so they now have your username, they have your email address, they have your password, and they can probably get access to your work email account uh, and uh, quite easily. And then the, the, there was one where the, where the, the 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 guys actually did exactly this with the CEO of, of of an organization. And what they actually did was they actually got into his account, and they realized it was a, there was an actual big project going on. And so they um, it was in the public sphere. So they actually when he was on holiday because they that's his, they also do it when people the people that the the the, the authorizer the one that's the, saying it is, is is usually not it's usually like either at a conference this guy was on safari on, on holiday and he'd been really busy so they he was they were saying not not to bother him but anyway they, they compromised his account they sent an email out to change these details on this project and he phrased the emails correctly like he would because they knew exactly how we how he would actually send emails and and also with those outbound emails that he was sending they were also deleting them so even if he happened to check his email and the sent items, he wouldn't actually see those emails being sent out. And they were also, also intercepting the emails coming back to him from people just, are you sure about this? You know, do you really want to do this? And, they, and they'd say, yes, they were, delete, they were, they were deleting wow. those as well and deleting the, res, the responses to those. So he didn't know this was going on. He was uncontactable because, like I say, he was on safari in, 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 in Kenya or somewhere. And so they, they actually did this transfer, I think, and I don't know exactly how much money it was, but I know it was over a million. Jesus. And it was eventually tracked to Singapore, but and they got some of it back, but not but not all of it but like that was just a very clever social engineering construct where they used exactly like you said they used data from the dark web to compromise this guy's work email account and then initiate this this scenario well you know yeah absolutely passwords and you reusing passwords i used to but over the last few years (laughs) i've changed a lot i i think up some wacky passwords and yeah well sentences are really good actually so having a sentence Actually, mm. that's what you know. That's actually better than actual even just password. Like to have a a phrase or something uh, with uh, with some numbers in there as well. That's actually very good. I, like I've started using the pass keys quite a lot, and yeah, pass keys, two factor yeah, yeah. authentication, and yeah. That but that's not even fallible either. I mean, it's great. It's another level, but MFA is not the answer to every yeah. question either. Well, and, and not you know? not the not the text based because you can be victim of a SIM swap, right? And yep. that it is the authenticator. Like you said, there's no perfect solution, but there's definitely strong it all helps. to what most people are doing. It, it all helps. It, it, it's like someone going past your house. Like, you know, if they see an alarm, they hear a dog, they'll they'll probably keep going to the house next door that doesn't have an alarm or doesn't have a dog. And unless they specifically really want to target you and they've been paid or have a reason to, to go after you, they're going to go for the, the lowest common denominator. Like, it's like the guy being chased by the bear, a couple of guys being chased and you can't outrun a bear. He said, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> You know? Exactly. Exactly. You know. <laughs> Good point. You know. <laughs> Listen, in, in terms yeah, of so. in terms of looking ahead, I, I'm forever the optimist yeah. and always hopeful. And that what I'd like to ask people is that what are you most hopeful about? Well, like I said earlier, like we've been a lot of doom and gloom there, but uh, things are actually improving. So I don't know if you saw that thing from Alliance there a few weeks ago. They did their risk report that they do, and they actually put cybersecurity ahead of like recession, ahead of conflicts around the world, about all these other things, inflation, you know, as the key worry and the key the, the key thing to be monitoring that the most impact organizations so it's a so it's, it is now i think it, once, once it's getting to that level that board level p- p- people are actually now starting to I think take it take it seriously what i'd like also like to see and it's i'm seeing it a bit but this is again you're involved in a lot of startups and stuff like that but actually building in the security from the beginning because you know so many people bring really cool services to, to market and like you know really quick they're excellent but there's holes everywhere like we even see it from our own developers like most of our developers in, in our organization are guys uh, late 40s 50s guys who have the, the old school kind of rigor of, of of actually building something solid and okay it might not be the quickest but it's actually because because the industry we in it has to work and it has to work every time and it has to not be vulnerable 
vulnerable and has to be written in the, in the correct way. And actually, we, we see with the younger guys, like they're really smart, really agile, but they don't have that same discipline. And, and maybe that's really ageist and reverse ageist thing for me to say, but it's 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 getting that kind of maybe uh, that message across as well. That it's great to build really cool, great looking s- systems that do cool things, but look, they have to be secure as well. You know, I, I recently invested in, in 12 startups and there's a number of them that are very, very focused on, listen, we know if we want to build a globally sustainable business here, that we need to get this set up right from the start. And yeah. just seeing a lot of what you're talking about and that while it may slow you down a bit at the beginning, yeah. that it's going to be worth the time. No, it is. And and it, and it isn't cool, isn't it? But like, it, it means then actually then they don't have to start retrofitting and, and that's always bad because when you're trying to make something secure that was built not secure, there's always going to be holes, you know. And uh, But some of the, the other good stuff, like, the, okay, I haven't gone about the, the bad actors using AI and machine learning and all that kind of stuff. But also... Like the good guys are using it as well mm. and getting really good at it. Like we're doing some really kind of cool stuff. Other people are too, you know. Around, I, I mentioned that behavioral stuff there. Actually, stopping people doing things as they're doing them rather than trying to preach to them. Actually, just talk to them when they, they don't realize they're actually going to do something silly. You know, like doing that. And and that's all around context. It's not just about security. It could be around compliance. It could be around just the policies of that organization. So if those implemented, the, it's like the, the, the system is watching for that and, you, and you're doing something that's going to endanger you or the organization, it pops up and, and tells you. That's all kind of the, the, the kind of behavioral AI type stuff that, 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 that I think is really cool. There's some really cool new stuff this new technology it's a company we're involved in that actually it's patent pending but like they actually are seeing it before it happens and so the indicators of attack rather than the actually indicators of compromise when something's actually happening and they're actually picking up on it before and they're actually publishing stuff on twitter or x or showing that they're seeing stuff be say before like say crowdstrike and dark trace and all these people who, who are in this space and it's better again a bit like what i was saying about us on the email security side of things stopping things before they actually get into your network like like you know stop the email getting in that's compromised with links or attachments they're actually stopping the attacks activating before they ever actually do you know so it's 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 quite clever really, really clever stuff. and there's lots of other stuff i'm sure that we that i don't know about and maybe you know mm. about that that, 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 well, that that are happening so it's not all one way with the ai stuff in a bad way you know yeah i i think it's you know one of one of the first guests on this show i think his name was stefan Euger back in 2018 he was a reformed hacker and he talked about the context of listen turning all of these things that he used to do not that he ever did anything wickedly nefarious but that and knowing the paths in and knowing what to do and be able to turn that around to be able to help people and to be able to show them the risks, show them the holes and that yeah. AI has kind of put a whole new context on this because yes, while there's tons of, of, of things that could be done with that against your will, obviously there's tons of good things that can be done with it as well. So, yeah, but yeah. Li- li- listen, where I'd like to round things out with these discussions, Niall, is that you know, we, we've already kind of covered off the fact that you were kicked out of religion class for asking too many questions. <laughs> and that we talked a bit about obviously your backstory, but what is one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about you? So I'm, I've become, and you as an American will know this, I've become a pickleball bore. Oh, really? So pickleball. Yes. Yeah. I played a lot of sport, tennis, badminton, squash, soccer, you know, all these things. But my body, my knees, especially, especially my right knees, bits so you know i'm always in pain playing and and my son is actually a college tennis player in the u.s and he was telling me that you know, he's in his part time they're playing pickleball i said but well, that looks stupid i looked at it. that's for old people isn't it and he said no no it's great crack and so there's actually i know it's mostly americans and, and other and other people from other nationalities not there's, there's about half half the club is actually irish and half is people coming and working from usually for american companies and stuff like that and we're all we, we play pickleball now and i've become addicted to it so i'm i'm a pickleball bore where do you play i've, I've we two play? tournaments last weekend. So we play we play in Sandyford. So it's played indoors on a badminton court, which with one different line. It's yeah. it's great fun and like you know, it's you know, we're, we're all, and, and we actually sponsor the South Dublin Shamrocks. All right. Listen, um, this there's is a, there's I there's a league into because a, 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 fr- a friend of mine tried to get me into squash probably about you know fifteen years ago. And it, it, we left that session with me probably feeling like I had just been in a rugby match. And that obviously there's no tackling in squash. It's just that, that, that rush. Well, it can be pretty physical push in squash. I played squash as well. Yeah, ar- yeah. Around the court. 
And so, yeah, I, I'd love to try again. So maybe I'll check out the South Dublin Shamrocks. Pickleball. Well, let me know and I'll bring you down for a hiss. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, listen, Niall, thank you so much. That was incredibly enlightening. Really brought me into a place that I just wasn't expecting to get that close <laughs> to, which is really understanding the psychology of the hacked and understanding, like we talked about, the hopefulness and the upside of this in addition to the downside. And so yeah. thank you. Really appreciate you coming out to the show to do this with me. No worries. And I'll have to get you on a pickleball court soon. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Niall. <laughs> Take care. See ya. That does it for this week, folks. Thanks to Niall Mackey for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts as it helps others to find the show. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early stage startup investor focused on where fintech meets crypto and crypto meets Web3 and I lead the Techstars Web3 Accelerator. There are plenty of links in the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie and how to get in touch with us, so don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya! <laughs>